Hey, what is up guys? So it's been a long time since we did a video on how to get better at Yu-Gi-Oh! And today we are going to be talking about adding consistency to your deck, which means that you'll be having a higher chance at drawing those key cards that you need for your combos, or simply being able to get so much of an advantage in the game where you're just able to either OTK your opponent or essentially stun them, making it so they can't do anything, and then you're just going to proceed to just beat them down. So first off, we're going to be talking about a bunch of cards that a lot of decks can run. Now obviously a card like Upstar Goblin probably wouldn't be the best thing in like chain burn so you know if you're playing a chain burn deck you know obviously don't run upstart goblin it's probably not the best choice unless you're playing some type of reverse burn like a bad reaction to samochi or nurse the fallen one you know reverse burn but upstart goblin has been getting very very popular and if you, any of you guys have seen the uh deck list from the uh last arg you know everyone is running upstart goblin so here's the thing with upstart goblin or any draw power card in general in yu gi -Oh! Usually there's some type of downside, you know, to the card. Obviously, having draw power, there has to be some downside. Otherwise, you know, why wouldn't everyone run three of everything? Uh, all the draw power cards if there was no technical downside. So we're going to be covering a bunch of draw power cards or consistency adding cards. And we're going to be talking about them. And we're going to be talking about how, you know, in certain decks, some of them will work better than others. As well as their downside and how you can kind of, you know, use them in combination with each other to actually speed up your deck and make it really, really fast. So uh, first off... Obviously, Upstore Goblin's a pretty self-explanatory card. I mean, obviously, if you're playing uh, a deck that runs more than 40 cards, you probably do not want to play Upstart Goblin, simply because, therefore, be getting rid of the point of running less card in your deck. Because, essentially, once you... If you're playing a 40-card deck and you run three Upstart Goblins, that makes it so you're running 37 cards, and that makes it so you have a higher chance of, again, drawing those key combos or, you know, just setting up for that really awesome field or that OTK that you're trying to do. So the downside with this card is that your opponent gains 1,000 life points. Now, that is very, very minimal. Even 3,000 life points, which is what it comes down to if you've activated all three upstar goblins in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, it's very minimal. It's not that much because a lot of monsters in this uh, game right now, they just have some insane effect and you're going to be able to establish a huge board or make something that, you know, your opponent can't deal with. An excellent example of that would be something like Yamato. Yamato is one of those cards where it's just like, regardless of, you know, how much life points disadvantage you're at, your opponent usually, they're at a point, like there's Kaiser Coliseum or if there's something like Vandy's Emptiness, they can't even respond to Yamato because, like, they can't target it, they can't destroy it, and they can't, you know, attack into it because you're just going to drop the crane. This card is one of those cards where it just kind of supports the idea of it doesn't really matter how much, you know, extra little life points you have. Obviously, something like 10,000 or 20,000 additional life points, that is just too much, but, you know, a few thousand probably won't make that big of a difference in a game. I know it can, but technically, especially if you're a competitive player, most of the times you're getting OTK, you're losing because you just don't have the answers to your opponent's you know, very large field, or you essentially just got OTK'd and you can't really do anything because maybe they activated Trap Stun, maybe they, you know, got rid of all your back row or something like that. But, you know, since Solemn Judgment, you know, has gone away, when this card was at 3, it didn't matter how much life points you were at. You were just going to negate everything your opponent did. It didn't matter that you were at, you know, you know, I don't know, 50 life points. Like, if you just had multiple Solemns, you could just keep on halving your life points. As long as you had the board, basically that just secured you victory in the game. Now, this card obviously is banned. It may never come back. It might actually come back probably at 1. I don't think this card will ever come back at 3 because once this card becomes at 3, it goes and supports the idea that it doesn't matter how much, you know, disadvantage you are in life points because your opponent can't really do anything. It goes to the same idea with something, uh, for example, like Abyss Gaios. That's one of those cards where once your opponent has it on board, like, you have to answer relatively soon, otherwise some decks just simply lose. Like, you, some decks, for example, is like Medulce's. Like, you go for your one, you know, combo, whether it's Angeli or it's Hoot Cake or it's Cat into, you know, any other Medulce, essentially, once that gets negated, like, what do you have as an option? You basically have to just end your turn. There's very limited things that you can do. Again, going back to the whole idea of just establishing a board or just OTKing your opponent. Next up, we're going to be talking about Pod Duality. Probably one of my favorite cards uh, that, you know, adds consistency to decks. Now, the downside with Duality actually has two downsides to it. Uh, obviously, the main downside that everyone is familiar with is that, uh, well, there's technically, you can only activate one poly duality per turn, but that's not the main downside. The main downside is you cannot special summon during the turn you activate this card. But, I mean, the down, the other downside can technically also be an advantage if you want to play the Yu-Gi-Oh! Bind game. So, the downside really comes down to, 
uh, you know, not only being able to not special summon, but the main downside is that your opponent now knows what you have in your hand. Whether you've added a, you know, Max C, a Effect Veiler, or something to protect yourself from getting OTK, maybe a Threatening Roar that you added, and then you're just going to set that card. They're going to maybe end phase Mystical Space Typhoon, and then you're going to lose that card because it's very obvious that that card is, you know, something that, you know, you just set. But, like I said, you can kind of play the Yu-Gi-Oh! mind games, and you can set a completely different card, and just keep that threatening roar in your hand. And perhaps your opponent, you know, if they don't have, you know, an MST, then maybe they'll just be like, okay, well, I'm not going to exhaust my field, I'm not going to drop my, you know, most powerful card, because he's just, just going to respond with a threatening roar and perhaps do something. When you, the card you're setting is maybe like a Reckless Greed or something, and you're going to be able to stall out for a little bit longer, and, you know, actually secure victory with that. But, like I said, duality has that downside of, basically, you can't special summon. Uh, next up, Reckless Greed, which is the card we kind of just talked about, but Reckless Greed works very well in combination with um, basically having multiples, the, the key card uh, that you want to activate multiple of. And I figured, you know, we'll briefly talk about uh, Reckless Greed's, you know, ruling on it. If you activate multiple Reckless Greed, which is basically what you want to do when you activate Reckless Greed, but the effect that is negative on this card, which is that you skip your next two drop phases, does not stack. Which means if I activate three Reckless Greeds all in the same turn, I still only skip my next two draw phases. I do not skip my next six draw phases. So the downside of this card is really not there if you're activating a bunch of cards. And there are a bunch of decks, for example, like Mermails right now, I've been getting really popular uh, because of Reckless Greed because that is a very, very easy deck to OTK or establish one of those uh, ideas of making a really powerful card like an Abyss Gaios, which basically can stun your opponent and it can make it so it doesn't matter that you're not going to be able to draw because you're going to have such a huge either advantage already on board or just going to be able to just OTK them anyways. I mean, if you are able to make like double Abyss Gaios and you have the proper protection for it, you basically win. I mean, there's very few decks that can actually do anything against two Abyss Gaios. I mean, Dark Holes, every time I summon Abyss Gaios, Dark Hole is what happens to him, but you know, that card definitely does stun a bunch of decks. But uh, yeah, basically, there's a lot of decks, for example, like the Heretic Rulers, that can really benefit from things like Reckless Greed, because, you know, uh, they are a deck where they just need one turn. That's all they need is that one turn, and they can just finish you off. And that's kind of the whole idea of Upstar Goblin anyways, and for some decks. Some decks play the game of, you know, controlling, uh, you know, basically st stunning your opponent, going back again to the whole Bujin idea. Um, but there are other decks that can just simply OTK. Next up, Card Card D, which is really popular right now in Fire Fist. Oh my gosh, Tensu plus Card Card D is like the best thing ever because the whole downside of Card Card D basically is kind of, you know, not there. Sure, you have to, you know, end your turn. Uh, and you technically would lose your normal summon, but you know, Tensu is still there. You can go still go tanky because you don't have to activate this at the start of your main phase one. I think that that really should have been added to Card Card D because, I mean, how many times have you guys played against a stall deck or something where they activate a bunch of cards and then they go Card Card D anyways and you're like, well, pff, what the heck, you know? Uh, but that's basically why Card Card D is so good in certain decks because, you know, you're able to use all your stuff and then go for Card Card D anyways right after. And again, it works really well with, um, Tensu, obviously, you can't enter your battle phase, so basically you can't attack, but you can still go tanky bear pop, and then being able to go card card D, well, first you summon card card D, and then you would have to go ahead and then uh, Tensu, and then go for your uh, tanky bear, or tensu, pop Tensu just to pop uh, a monster, then go for your card card D effect, and obviously you don't get your battle phase, and bear might be a little bit lonely, but as long as you can protect it, you know, the downside is not really there. Also, I figured it's good to mention the uh, ruling on card card D, that um, if you normal summon him, let's say he gets effect bailer, he gets abyss guiles, some, something stops his effect from activating. You can no longer use his effect on a later turn, because it only works on the turn it was normal summon, so that's just like, you know, good ruling if you happen to match up against someone that is playing that, you can effect bailer this thing, you can, you know, skill drain, well, you do a lot of different other things, just basically just getting rid of Karkardi's effect and uh, not being able to activate it uh, at a later time is basically what it comes down to. But these, I would say, are the four main cards that you can run in majority of decks. Obviously, there are other cards like Cup of Ace, uh, which is a really sacky card, but if you're playing something like the uh, deck that discards your opponent's entire hand, then yeah, that doesn't really matter. But, you know, not every deck can play some of these cards. For example, I would say if you're playing something like the Heretic Rulers, uh, there's very limited room anyways. Like, you don't really need to have Upstart Goblet. I mean, if you have extra room, hey, that's totally cool. And maybe you can fit Upstart Goblet in there. But I would say there are some decks that don't really need these cards. Like, if you're having trouble with consistency 
consistency on your deck, uh, you know, you can definitely look into some of these cards. Because I get asked all the time, Asian Eyes, I need help with my deck, I keep on losing. And a lot of times, it's not necessarily because that um, your deck is bad, it's just that you have a lot of cards that need a lot of combo pieces. An excellent example of deck that requires a lot of combo pieces, I would say, is like a Gladiator Beast deck. There are things to <laughs> Gladiator Beast which you can't use, and it's just a simple example. It's not a very insanely combo-oriented deck, but it's a very simple concept for a lot of you beginner players to understand that, for example, you cannot actually ward tear it when you do not have a Gladiator Beast, and when you don't have any backward to protect your Gladiator Beast, it usually dies because they're too weak. And so, it comes with the idea of you know, basically being able to get those combo pieces together, which would just be a Gladiator Beast and a War Chariot, and pretty much, you know, other back row to stop them from just, you know, attacking over your Gladiator Beast is really what it comes down to. And things like Upstar Valbun and Pod of Reality definitely help out, as well as, you know, other decks that can be a little bit more explosive. Obviously, in a deck like Gladiator Beast, where it maintains a more of a control aspect, Reckless Greed might not be the best thing. However, you can still successfully use it, technically, because if you're able to, you know, set up with your War Chariots, all you need to do is attack Equest Cherry uh, forever, you know what I mean? Uh, but the thing is, in a deck like Gladiator Beast, you probably wouldn't want something like Karkar D because it's one of those, uh, you know, slightly combo oriented decks. Because if you don't have your Gladiator Beast on the field, unless you're playing Gladiator Beast with, you know, Tensu, which would be kind of a cool thing to try out, uh, but I think Fire Fists are probably the more consistent uh, deck, anyways. But uh, yeah, you probably don't want to play Karkar D in your uh, Gladiator Beast deck. But I hope this helps you out, guys, to try to get a better understanding of adding consistency to your deck because, like I said, sometimes it's just one of those uh, decks where you just need some of those combo pieces, and these four cards right here, I would say, are the most relevant ones in the game right now. And you know, Yu Gi Oh is a uh, evolving game, and perhaps maybe in the future we'll get to the point where Cup of Ace is the next best card because it doesn't matter as long as you're able to get that OTK, who cares? But Effect Miller Maxi definitely changed the game on that aspect. But anyways, if you guys want to check out any previous episodes of Get Better at Yu-Gi-Oh, I'll leave a link down below in the description box. But anyways, thanks for watching guys, have a great day. And if you guys have any, any other cards that are great for, uh, you know, most decks, I picked these four because I feel like they are probably the most relevant ones and uh, they are probably the best ones at the moment, but the game will always change. You know, D-Draw is at three. Hey, maybe Destiny Heroes might get some new support in the future. But anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Have a great day. Asian Eyes, out.